introduce the, the next speaker, uh, changing completely subjects. Uh, now let me introduce Reto Piran, uh, who has a PhD in acoustics from the Delft University of Technology. Uh, is an expert on uh, environmental sound oralization and virtual acoustics, lecturing at ETH Zurich, and last but not least, uh, head of environmental acoustics research group at ENPA, which is a Swiss federal laboratory for materials sciences and technology. So, uh, Rito, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to my presentation. Next slide, please. So I'm happy that uh, I have here the floor to tell you a little bit and share with you some of our most recent research we did at our lab for acoustics and noise control at EMPA uh, regarding acoustic comfort, subjective perception and psychoacoustic indicators. Next slide. So I'm happy that in this uh, audience, I do not need to explain to you that sound and noise are not the same thing. Next, and also that acoustic comfort is a function of sound, but not uh, entirely determines the acoustic comfort. Next, but somehow uh, in these equations, we have to consider sound perception. Uh, so we have to introduce the human being and understand uh, its reaction uh, to a certain acoustic stimulus. And in our uh, acoustical engineering practice. Next, what we typically do is we describe an acoustical situation by some uh, indicators that are then used for an assessment of this situation. And ideally, uh, this does apply to railways, but also in general. Next, we would use this assessment to influence the acoustical situation. So to design it somehow, and that's what we call a perception-based design. But the question remains, what indicators should we use uh, to characterize an acoustical situation? Next, so in our research, we mainly work with these three fields shown here below. So of certainly the study of sound perception, psychoacoustics, but also we have to consider human reaction, which includes, for instance, health effects, but also acoustic comfort or uh, cognitive performance, for instance. And the tool that we typically use uh, and that we work on is oralization. So in the next few uh, minutes, I will uh, invite you to uh, some work we did regarding these uh, three domains. Um, classical field surveys are performed with LAQ-based metrics. I'll show you here some results of the most recent Swiss nationwide noise annoyance field study where we um, evaluated or where we derived some exposure response relationships as shown here for the percentage of people being highly annoyed in the population as a function of, on the left-hand side, the day, evening, night level, on the right-hand side, the 24 hours LAQ. But there is certainly more to human perception than the LAQ. Next, and we investigated this, for instance, in a sleep lab study where we had participants exposed to nocturnal train pass by sounds. And we found that the temporal behavior really matters. I show you here an example of two train pass by sounds, the sound level of pass by A left and pass by B on the right hand side. And we found that the physiological reaction to these pass bys was significantly higher for pass by B as compared to A. It was a more than 200% increase in the cortical activation rate as compared to baseline. We cannot explain this next by the LAQ or the sound exposure level because sound exposure level for pass by A is eight decibels higher as compared to B. And we can also not explain these differences by the maximum level because that maximum level of these two events is exactly the same. Although I must say that maximum level in the overall study was a significant parameter for uh, psychological reactions or sleep disturbances. Next, what we found was that uh, main reactions occurred for pass by B at the instance where uh, the sound level is rapidly increasing. So when the decisive parameter in the end next was the uh, maximum slope, which was five times higher for pass by B. So in order to better investigate and understand the links between sound and the human reactions, we, as I mentioned already, we usually 
de develop and work with oralization models. Next. So oralization can be seen as the acoustical counterpart to visualization. It's actually a simulation technique to artificially render an acoustical situation audible. It has a long tradition, mainly in the field of uh, room acoustics, uh, but there's an increasing interest in um, design, or product design, but also in the environmental acoustics. Next, it has quite many applications. For instance, it can be used as a communication instrument. It's much more intu intuitive and effective to uh, present some audible experiences instead of uh, communicating abstract uh, indicators such as decibel values to stakeholders. And we also use it, for instance, for research to develop uh, or assess uh, noise indicators. Next. We typically follow uh, or try to follow a flexible oralization approach where starting from some source specification, we synthesize uh, some sound signals as emitted by a certain source. And then we propagate these uh, uh, signals uh, or these signatures to a virtual observer in, in the 3D space. So for that, we consider the, th the 3D geometry, environmental conditions such as weather, and we simulate sound um, propagation effects by uh, digital filters. In the end, we then render these sounds audible through a, a reproduction system, being loudspeakers or headphones, by considering the direction of the incident sounds in order to uh, create a spatial sound field. Why do we do that? It's important that people are able to localize the sound sources because uh, this increases uh, the immersion in the acoustical scene and by that increases the plausibility of such a simulation. Next slide, please. We use oralization to synthesize stimuli for psychoacoustic experiments because with oralization, this allows to, uh, for a systematic variation of parameters. We can, for instance, uh, examine sound characteristics uh, such as, uh, in the case of wind turbine noise, a typical amplitude modulation. Next. Below, you can see a graph where we measured short-term noise annoyance uh, in, in the lab and compared uh, wind turbine noise to road traffic noise. And we found uh, a so-called psychoacoustic shift next between these two noise sources of four, between four and 5.5 decibels uh, equivalent the DBA level. So at the same A-weighted level, wind turbine noise is more annoying um, was found to be more annoying than road traffic noise as the reference source. So we could attribute some of the spectral differences between these sources to the psychoacoustic indicator loudness. But we also found um, uh, effects of amplitude modulation in wind turbine noise, which amounted to one to two decibels uh, equivalent. Uh, and these uh, could be attributed to the psychoacoustic parameter fluctuation strength. Um, next, we went a couple of steps further in, in aircraft noise application together with the German Airspace Center DLR, where we synthesize virtual flyovers of new aircraft designs and new flight procedures in order to uh, evaluate these new uh, technologies using a perception-based approach. So. Um, we are currently um, continuing this work in the context of a, a large uh, European uh, project called Artem with more than 20 partners where we, uh, where new um, propulsion systems are designed and we will evaluate them using such synthesized uh, flyovers. Next. So in, with this approach, we are able to listen into the future and use, uh, use these virtual sounds to evaluate these technologies. Next, but now I'd like to go to railway noise. Uh, so I now I ask Barbara to press the button every two or three seconds automatically. Um, so we typically, you could start, Barbara. Thank you. We uh, model a moving train by a collection of uh, of point sources in uh, allocated to physically every. Two or th yeah, thanks. <laughs> Allocated uh, to to the train, um, 
and so in, in total, we then model such a train by more than 100 sources typically. So for each of these physically, uh, physical sources, we synthesize a, a sound signal. So it's a, a time domain simulation approach. And for each of these time signals, we propagate these signals then to a receiver position somewhere uh, located in this three-dimensional space, uh, considering that the sources move and therefore also the propagation geometry uh, changes over time. So all the propagation effects change over time. We do that by um, uh, using time uh, varying digital filters. So press a couple of more times, please, to illustrate what I just said. Next, next, next. So by that we can, for instance, model reflections at, uh, at some boundaries. We can also um, model uh, diffraction by, uh, um, by a noise barrier, for instance. Next, 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 next. Okay, here, um, for rolling an impact noise, we developed a physics-based emission synthesizer, which starts by next um, modeling the exi roughness excitation signal first. So these are spatial signals representing the surface uh, microstructure of the rails and of the wheels. Next, we then uh, transform these signals into time uh, signals and uh, consider also the, the, the modal behavior of the track wheel system by introducing filters where, um, uh, which contain the, the modal information of these structures. Next. Now I would like to present you some uh, audible results of this synthesizer. So please um, start the, the sound by pushing the, the loudspeaker symbol, Barbara. No, the loudspeaker symbol. Yes. So what you can hear now is a pure emission signal synthesized as uh, captured by a microphone traveling together with the wheel on axis. So in, in the next simulation, again, now we introduce directivity effects, sound propagation effects, and also a, a stereophonic rendering, which will probably not go through the Zoom connection. So probably you only heard it in, in mono, but it's actually a stereophonic rendering. So we, you could clearly hear now propagation effects added to it, such as Doppler, uh, Doppler frequency shift, etc. And now we can start changing parameters. So in the next uh, animation or simulation, uh, uh, roughness of the rail was increased. Or we can introduce a wheel flat. So this is just a simulation of a single axle. So what we did on, in, in next slide, um, we also modeled, of course, a whole train uh, pass by scenarios, and we developed a prototype for a railway noise demonstrator using virtual reality technologies uh, in the um, completed a shift to rail project destinate. So starting from a scenario, we have an oralization and a visualization model that are coupled together and produce some uh, um, virtual reality output, you could say. So, um, um, and this system then allows for different um, reproduction system or for different um, presentation modes. Next. I would like to now to explain a little bit more what they mean. So on the next slide, you can see a photo of our oralization uh, lab facility that we run and operate at EMPA, which features a 3D audio reproduction system. So this allows to create a spatial uh, impression of such virtual train pass by sounds in a, um, a very controlled environment and with calibrated sound reproduction. Next. We also um, reproduce these uh, virtual scenes via head-mounted displays and calibrated headphones in such a virtual reality application, which is then a very portable way of presenting uh, a scenario to, to, the, to the public or to certain 
politicians, for instance. Next. Now, in this uh, case, I would wanted to show you some videos, which was technically not possible, unfortunately. So on the next slide, you can see a comparison of this uh, um, virtual train pass by, by uh, what happens when you introduce a noise barrier so that not only the sound level changes and not only the spectrum changes, but really the sound characteristic actually changes due to this intervention. Next. We also modeled more complicated scenes, such as a railway line cutting, where then multiple reflections occur between the train body and the sidewall, uh, and the sound field is finally then diffracted over the edge of this uh, cutting. Next. So that's where the video would have been. Uh, but I would like to invite you to experience these or, or, or check these videos on, on, the, on, on the web by yourself. So next, we have uploaded them on a web-based sharing platform, YouTube. Next, so if you search for the YouTube channel Virtual Acoustics Empire, you will find some standard videos uh, with the stereophonic rendering, but also some next uh, 360 degree spherical videos that should be played back uh, on a smartphone, tablet or PC using headphones. And they also um, include some spatial audio, so which then allows to have a binaural rendering of these uh, different scenarios that we rendered. These are all examples from the Shift Rail project Destinate. And I think that uh, the speaker, Judy Zandor, will then also tell a bit about this in, in a later talk. So this brings me to the conclusions next. So there is certainly more to human perception than just the A-weighted LAQ, as I've shown with some examples. And in our work, or, or I'm convinced that oralization is actually a key tool to link sound and uh, human reaction. So it's a key tool for the acoustical assessment in the end. Uh, it has already shown to be a good tool for communication purposes. And in the end, it would be nice to use it for a perception-based uh, design. Uh, we rely on physics-based synthesis because this is a very flexible approach, which in the end then allows to incorporate also mitigation measures and complex scenarios. And this brings me to the, to the outlook. So we will uh, are currently further progressing with this in the railway domain in the ongoing uh, shift rail project, Silver Star. So we will, you will certainly hear more about this in the next two years from us. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Aetro. Uh, and we could see that there, there, there's a, a, a real uh, advance in state of the art methods for simulation and uh, oralization, relying on uh, physical uh, models, then going into hearing models that can be used for perception studies. And uh, this is very much in the uh, also what you showed in the uh, uh, as a comparison with the uh, aircraft sector shows that we are already in the in the trends of the current studies. So that's very, very interesting for inspiring for the what we are doing in the future in terms of improving the indicators for uh, for um, and being a, a good neighbor. <laughs>